Yeah. So I was like, okay, now I got to smile. <laughs> I know. I'm like, all right. So we're recording. So good morning. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Jonna and this is Shannon Mouthfish with Effingham Area Alzheimer's Awareness. And I'm with Effingham Library. So we're here today to talk to you about dementia and how your community can become better prepared to help those who are dealing with that diagnosis and their loved ones. So to do that, we're gonna start, this is just a dry one. We're gonna start by <laughs> sharing our PowerPoint that we put together. So I'm gonna share my screen. So I'm gonna let Shannon begin. She's the expert in this role and so she'll start. Okay, our organization, Effingham Area Alzheimer's Awareness, um, developed this program, Friends in Rural Places. It's for, to build dementia-friendly businesses and communities. Um, a, a little bit about our organization. My mother-in-law was diagnosed with Alzheimer's in 2002, and our family was uh, instrumental in caring for her. My daughter at the time was 10 years old, and so she grew up having to watching the family caring for her grandmother. And she wanted to help people in that situation. So when she graduated from high school, she went to college and became a social worker. She is now an LCSW. And um, she works for an organization in St. Louis that helps people with dementia stay in their homes as long as possible. After she finished her training, she got her master's degree at St. Louis University, and she wanted to bring that information back here to the Effingham area. And so she asked me if I would form a nonprofit with her. And so in 2014, we became a nonprofit. And since that time, we have done educational uh, programs and a lot of different things. We've expanded from Effingham County. We are now in seven counties in the area and we're focused on rural support. That's very important because I know it's hard for people to imagine, but in rural areas, there are a few doctors who specialize in geriatric or even dementia care. And there is a lot of stigma around the idea of someone having a diagnosis like that simply because there are a lot of unknowns and people aren't sure what a journey like this looks like. So, from a library's perspective, we were very grateful whenever Amy and Shannon began this journey together, creating this nonprofit. It was something that was happening in our community that we were aware of, and we were really excited to see it grow. And um, we spent a lot of time um, just promoting it and offering their classes at our library. It was a really great collaborative fit very instrumental because she worked with us from the very beginning and uh, we've had a very good collaboration over the years. It's important to know what's going on in your community. So as library um, staff, we always want to be listening and finding out what's there. We didn't realize there was such a need for this until Shannon and Amy began this, um, began pushing through this. So the mission of Friends in Rural Places is to educate the people of Effingham County and the surrounding area about dementia and the effects on families and caregivers to help foster a dementia-friendly community. Our goal is to equip all businesses and agencies with knowledge, resources, and confidence to help people living with dementia and their caregivers live a quality life. So that is the mission um, of our program because dementia is a very difficult disease. Uh, for the caregivers, for the person living with dementia, for the families of people living with dementia. I, didn't think I understood exactly how difficult it was until I was working with you, Shannon, and seeing some of the statistics, the fact that most caregivers, will, some pass away even before their loved one dies. Especially spouses, if a spouse is caring for another spouse, uh, it's 30 to 40 percent will pass away or die before the person with the dementia which is really a bad statistic. It's horrible. Mm -hmm. And then the fact that many people are caring for their loved ones, um, their elderly loved ones at the same time that they're caring for young families as well. It's something called the sandwich generation. Yes, and I was part of that because my youngest son was born two months after my mother-in-law's diagnosis. And so I had young children to take care of and then um, 
also I help take care of my mother-in-law. So, yeah. So people aren't alone, and yet they very much feel that way. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important from a library's perspective or any business to be aware that when people come to you or they're in your building, many of them are experiencing stress that you might have no idea about, and they might not even be able to verbalize why they are upset or, or stressed. Or stressed. Mm -hmm. I thought another interesting um, statistic that's come along through this, and we're really grateful um, to have this Friends in Real Places program, is the fact that so many of them are facing depression. Yes. Yes. I mean, is, was it 40% of all caregivers? Or more. Six, I think it's up to 60% of oh caregivers gosh. can have depression because most of them don't get out. They don't socialize. They have all the care themselves. They don't have a lot of help. Um, so it's, it's really hard for a lot of caregivers. Yes, and of course the pandemic that we're all experiencing, and that's together. made it even worse. That's made it worse. I also read an interesting statistic recently in care.com that men are actually being called in to care. They're becoming more and more involved mm -hmm. in the caregiving of elderly people, which I think is encouraging because mm -hmm. we can use all the support yes. we can give. Yeah. So um, it, it, it takes it takes a village, basically. It, you need all the help you can get. We were blessed that uh, my husband's family helped a lot with her care uh, because it is very difficult. And unfortunately, a lot of families, a lot of people don't have families that help. It's all one person or two at the most. So it's very difficult. And that's another reason why we're really grateful to have this collaboration in our community. So from our library's perspective, just a little bit, so you know a little bit about Effingham and geographically where we are, because I realized with this being the Association of Bookmobile Outreach um, Library, we're really excited. We are in a little tiny part of Illinois. We're over in the um, East Central. We're in Effingham County. It's, um, it's an interesting county. The bottom half from the south end of it down, basically, um, if you look at the interstates, just where they meet, the east-west one or the one going right to left. South of that, it's a pretty interesting um, situation because there's a lot of food disparity. Actually, um, yeah, it's a food desert south of Effingham. And we also have a county that amazingly enough has 600 families that don't have transportation. And as you can see, there's not, you can imagine, there's not a lot of bus service or opportunities in our community for rural transportation, which makes it challenging mm -hmm. if you're a caregiver. We also um, have a, our fourth graders, about 42, no, sorry, 52% of them are not reading at um, the national level, which is concerning for us because we know that means a quality of life and um, challenges. And also down the road, just, you know, how are they going to be able to care for their families? Our library as a whole, though, we function, we're just a city library. So we provide connection and service to the residents in our city, they pay property taxes toward the library. Illinois is kind of weird like that. Um, so this has been a great opportunity to work with an organization that doesn't have those same limitations that our library does. Um, and we see ourselves as a catalyst for positive change. We want positive things to happen. We're excited when they happen. It doesn't have to be for the library itself. We'd like to see them happen for other organizations and just be able to collaborate along the alongside them. So that's a little bit of the background just from like our area of the world and how how we operate. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why dementia friendly businesses are important. Um, there's an increased prevalence of Alzheimer's uh, and related dementia and it'll continue in the future years. Uh, oh, in the state of Illinois or in the United States, we have over 5 million people that have Alzheimer's disease. That's almost 6 million people now. And over the age of 65, one in eight people will get Alzheimer's. And I think that number is going like one in seven, one in six. Um, it depends on who you talk to. Over the age of 85, one in three people will die with Alzheimer's. It may not be the cause of death, but they will have Alzheimer's. Uh, 70 to 90% of the people with dementia live at home especially you know in the early years um, you know, and some of them even die at home but uh, there's more placements i think are uh, movements into the memory homes and the nursing homes but um, that's a big statistic there and your patrons and your customers are affected by these 
these diseases. They want to choose a business that's easiest to navigate and that have helpful, knowledgeable staff. If you understand dementia, if you understand Alzheimer's and what uh, the symptoms are and what, what you need to do to better communicate with them, that will make all the difference in the world. And it really will. Um, we, we have patrons that are in the early stages of dementia that we, we meet with and use our facility, and we're glad that we, they do. It's really important that they stay connected in the community for their own mental health as well as just being able to be out. And like Shannon showed the slide with the 70 to 90%, these are people in your community. So don't feel like you're alone if you're going through these kinds of situations. And a lot of times in our area, um, you, you will probably know these people because they come in, you know, we're not a, a huge uh, metropolitan area. So these people, you kind of develop a relationship with them. And so you know them and you can tell something's off or, or you, know, you can kind of tell sometimes. And so it's important for you to understand what you can do to help them. But it's also the same thing. We never, we never want to assume either mm -hmm. because as Shannon goes along in her presentation, there are a lot of other things that can cause these same symptoms mm -hmm. and you want to be aware of those whenever you're interacting with anyone. So dementia friendly communities are places where individuals with dementia are able to live good lives. They have the ability to live as independently as possible. They continue to be part of their communities and are met with understanding. They're given the support when necessary. They want to be able to go to the bank. They want to be able to go to the library. They want to be able to go to the grocery store. And in the early stages, usually they can. They may need a little help sometimes, um, but they want to be part of the community yet. They want to socialize. Uh, having dementia is a very isolating disease. A lot of people don't, when somebody has, if someone they know has dementia, they, they don't know how to act towards them. They don't know how to interact with them. And so if we develop dementia-friendly communities, everyone will understand dementia and they will understand how they can communicate and how they can interact with others living with dementia. So uh, like I said, they want to be able to navigate successfully. They want to access the businesses and communities sites that are familiar to them. They want to maintain social networks and a sense of belonging. And that's very important to everyone, especially someone with dementia. So true. <laughs> so an overview of dementia-friendly communities. It, they originated in the United Kingdom and they're now countries all over the world. In the United States, there were two areas, the metropolitan area of Minneapolis, St. Paul, and also the southeast part of Wisconsin uh, were one of the first areas to start dementia-friendly communities. And Dementia-Friendly America was initiated in July of 2015 by the White House Council on Aging. And Dementia-Friendly Community Initiative seeks to encourage people living with dementia and their families to stay engaged in their community and feel supported to live independently and well. So now we have a YouTube video, which we're gonna try and see if it will play for us, but we'll have to share a new screen. So we're going to do a new share. So bear with us a moment. And we're gonna go and we're gonna share going to go back to this. I apologize. I'm going to drive through this to see if we can get Oh, Shannon, this is where I needed to have the other one open at the same time. <laughs> you need to, okay, we need to do this first. No, I mean, you can try, but see, it won't. Come on, YouTube, look for us. Hey, okay. Maybe it's gonna work for us. That's what I was like. Yes. <laughs> but I didn't do that. It's and I was gonna cut us off, but I'm like, we're doing so well. I know. I'm like, maybe oh, this is just the one. <laughs> I feel like this lady just <laughs> I can relate. <laughs> I'm with you. I think we're doing great. I think we're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. We can do this. This is stupid to not. <laughs> I'm like, Jonna. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. 
and it's probably videoing us, but that's okay. We'll, we'll just do it again. We'll do it again. We gotta do it over in there. Yeah, we do. <sighs> But I love this video because I just think it sums it up. It does. I don't just want to cry when I watch it. Oh, Shannon, I just see this. I know. And it's, it's so happening. simple to, yeah. so simple to help. But I see every day things like this happen, mm -hmm. and we're just all so stinking busy and worried. And Here you expect the worst to happen. <laughs> yeah, believe me, I thought she was going to walk out in traffic. Go and go, and I was like, oh, I understand. <laughs> Now we come back. Let's try to push the thing so it's in its own way. So there's the okay, just, screen. just a second. I want to pause yeah. this. Sure. Go ahead. No, okay. I just want to make sure we keep it here. Okay, you can do that. That right. should be paused. Now you're paused. Okay, and let's start yeah. over again. Okay. Okay. Okay, now that's paused. Right, right. Now we're still sharing our screen. So let's try, if you push on that green, if you go up here, so new share, and that'll take us back to Jeez. this, but it should have taken us to, sorry that the thing is over. Right. No, you're fine, it's not you. You're Gosh. good, you're yeah. good. Try that, yep. So new share, and then that one. Oh, sorry. Oh. Share. See, this is what too many steps to me on my page. I'll go to PowerPoint then and try it. Yep. Go here. Good job. And now we're going to move on to the next one. Okay. So, so next. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So wow. After that video. <laughs> which unfortunately people face every day. Shannon's gonna talk more about the foundations of dementia. Well, dementia is a processing disorder. It affects the activities of daily living and the activities of daily living are being able to get out of bed, dressing yourself, going to the bathroom yourself, taking your medication yourself, feeding yourself, fixing your food, feeding yourself. Uh, things that we do all the time that we don't even think about. These are what's called the activities of daily living. And dementia affects one or more of those. And um, so I know all of you probably heard that, well, memory loss 
is a, is a symptom of dementia, and it is. And it's probably the most common because Alzheimer's disease is one of the most common dementias, and memory loss is the most common symptom of Alzheimer's disease. But there are other symptoms, and they are impaired judgment. They may make decisions that they normally would not have made if uh, they did not have dementia. They have changes in effect, a change in mood swings. They could be happy one minute and all of a sudden get really angry over something that you don't have any idea what it is. Also, they have trouble with abstract thinking. If their life goes on normal, have no problem, nothing breaks, nothing goes wrong, they can do okay. But if something breaks or something doesn't go the way they think, it should go. They have trouble figuring out how to fix things. Uh, trouble with math and finances. This is one of the things that families usually notice most. They get a, the person living with dementia gets an overdraw notice. Um, adding and subtracting for some reason is very difficult for people with dementia. Changes in or challenges in orienting to place person, place, and time. You hear people saying calling their children by their sister's name or their or their brother's name or maybe even their mother or father's name um, or a place they they don't recognize a place maybe the daughter moved within the last year or two and and they go to their new home and they say well they don't live here they live on cherry street but that was the home before uh, and time um, they don't they think they've been watching the tv show for an hour and it's only been 10 minutes or it could be the opposite. They've been sitting there for 10 minutes and think they've been sitting there for two hours. Um, so they have their concept of time is uh, is off. Difficulty with language. They may not know, they may forget what something is called. I know my mother-in-law, she said a plane. She pointed out towards the window and said a plane. And I looked and I didn't see it, but she was looking at a fly but she couldn't come up with the name fly. So she said plane because, you know, planes fly. And so, and then they also may not understand what you're saying um, also. And then sensory changes, their eyesight, their depth of perception can change. Um, their hearing, they may hear too much around them. They can't distinguish what what's going on right in front of them. They hear other sounds, and we're going to talk about that later. So it's not just memory loss. It's a lot of different symptoms that you may see in somebody in the beginning stages of dementia. Right. I think it's important to also, I think you'll touch on this later, the fact that it's not always dementia, so don't panic. Uh -huh. All of us have had <laughs> symptoms similar to these at different times. And Well, I know myself, if I don't get a good night's sleep, I don't think as clearly. And, right. and so sleep is a big factor also. So it's really important during these stressful times that you take as good care as you can of yourself as well as those around you. So uh, you've heard the term dementia, you've heard the term Alzheimer's. Uh, what's the difference? Well, dementia is an umbrella term of over 100 different types of um, dementias. Um, it's Alzheimer's disease is the most common. 60 to 80 percent of people with dementia have Alzheimer's disease. Most of them are very rare. Uh, the ones that I've listed here are the most common. Uh, Alzheimer's disease, like I said, one in six or one in eight over the age of 65 mm -hmm. and one in three over the age of 85. Uh, will get Alzheimer's disease. The Lewy body dementia. Um, it starts usually later in life, but their first, the first symptoms for that can be hallucinations and sleep issues. They can't get their sleep and hallucinations. And then eventually they will have memory issues also. Uh, the frontal temporal dementia, there's three different variations of this. And unfortunately, this, the frontal temporal dementias usually start, or they can start in the 40s. Usually, it's more common in the 40s to 60s. Um, one variant is behavioral. They may do things in public that they would never have done before. They may, you know, want to get undressed. They may say something, you know, say you're fat, or you know, you something that they would never have said if they didn't have dementia. Another one is where they show no emotion. I've heard that a lot of people get divorced because 
one or the other has no feelings for the other one, no affection, shows no affection or no emotion. And later they find out that the spouse had frontal temporal dementia. Yes. Yes. Wow. And then also the third variant is uh, aphasia, primary progressive aphasia, which affects speech. They can't say their, get their words out or, and they also can't understand very well. So, and so memory issues usually are, are definitely are not first, but sometimes will come later on. And um, that's the frontal temporal dementias. Vascular dementia, it's the lack of blood flow to the brain. It could be caused by a stroke. Uh, TIAs are what they call mini strokes. Um, so, or it can be uh, neck issues, neck veins and arteries are clogged that can cause vascular dementia. That's usually uh, confusion and memory loss at first. And that's usually a stair step progression. You know, they'll have a stroke and they'll, they'll lose some, some uh, memory and maybe some movement on one, of, one side or the other, and but they'll be f fine for a while until they have another stroke and then they'll decline further. Um, so that's kind of a stair step decline. Uh, dementia associated with Parkinson's. 80% of people with Parkinson's will develop some memory loss and confusion, but usually it's eight, 10 years down the road. Um, so I, that was a statistic that I um, learned in a conference that I attended that I was surprised at. And then we have mixed dementia. Uh, a lot, most of the time it's Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia, but it can be Alzheimer's and Lewy body or uh, you know, any combination of these dementias. Like I said, these are the most common. There are many others. Um, ALS, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease is a dementia. Huntington's disease is a dementia. Anything that affects the brain. And it's very important information to have. I'm really grateful to have Shannon to participate with this because she just has such an in-depth knowledge of what your the people you're dealing with may actually be struggling with or what their loved one at home might have. So if someone decides to share that with you or something along those lines, you have a little bit of a background knowledge of what they might be facing and, and how you might be able to help them. Uh, also, there's early onset Alzheimer's. Um, this affects adults under the age of 65. And these people uh, interact and they hold roles with their families that and communities that are different in ways of those over the age of 65. Alzheimer's, I, I know there's cases as early as in the 30s. It's not all common. It's not very common, but it can happen. And usually all, early onset Alzheimer's is more hereditary, um, but they can have young people at home, young kids mm -hmm. at home. They may be the primary uh, breadwinner. They may be the person that's working and who's bringing in the money. And if they get Alzheimer's, it really affects the family terribly. And so research shows uh, these risk factors for dementia age, of course. Um, the older you get, the more likely you will have dementia. Cardiovascular health, if you have high blood pressure and high blood sugar, those are uh, risk factors. Family history, like I said, early onset is more hereditary, but um, if you've had a parent that had Alzheimer's or uh, family members, there's a slightly higher risk diet. Um, if you have a poor diet, uh, fatty, a heart problem, you know, we talked about heart, but if you don't eat a lot of vegetables and fruits and, and things like that, you're more at risk for um, uh, dementia. And then physical activity, they've come out, you know, in the last several years and said physical activity is very important too. And the more you keep moving, the uh, less chance you'll have uh, dementia. And this is for funding, especially for a rural community, because a lot of people, like I shared with you earlier, that slide of Effingham County, the south end of that count or our county is in a food desert. The only place that they really have for food and vegetables, if you're not growing a garden or if you're not, um, if you're just, if you weren't brought up to cook for yourself or something along those lines, is, is really like a dollar general. We have a lot of those. And unfortunately, they don't have a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables. So as a library, that's something to keep in mind. You want to be able to offer and remember those kinds of programs for your community. There is an importance in those. Mm -hmm. It's more than just teaching 
you know, making sure that kids know how to eat well, it really matters in the long run because that's going to give them a better shot at being healthy as they age. Physical activity is another one. It's hard to, um, a lot of people tend to stay in their homes, especially during this pandemic. I can appreciate we're in a rural community. It's easier to go outside and walk and not be around others. But especially in an urban area, it is tough to find time and place to exercise. Mm -hmm. and, and we all work really busy lives. So it's important that that diet and physical activity are things that your library is thinking about too, because there are ways to support that and to help that. One of the um, programs that Shannon's group, the Effie Nimmer Alzheimer's offers for our library is actually like how to, you know, how not to, how to do your best not to end up with Alzheimer's. It's kind of, you know, how to take care of yourself. We've how, to have a, how to have a healthy brain. Is yes, what called, that's basically. what it's called. Yeah, right. And if you have a healthy heart, you'll probably have a healthy brain. So that's, right. you know, that's uh, one of the programs that we offer. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to say there is no cure for dementia. There's a lot of research going on. Um, and they, you, right now, there's no way to prevent it except by doing the good diet, exercise, that type of thing. It may not prevent it, but they say it may uh, push it back so it doesn't start as early, possibly. They don't know. And it's a progressive disease. That means it's going to get worse. There's, it's, it's, there's no doubt about it, it's going to get worse. It just progresses um, and it could take four years. It could take 20 years, it, depending on the disease and depending on the person. Every person with Alzheimer's is different. You can't say in year five, they're gonna forget their, um, the names of their children or that in year four, they're gonna wonder. It's different with everyone. My mother-in-law never wondered. Um, and so they may have some of the symptoms, but they may have not have others. So it's, it's a very difficult disease. This, the health issues here, <clears throat> I always talk about that because this is something that's very important. People are worried about Alzheimer's and other dementias. And so if they have some memory loss or confusion, they get scared and sometimes they don't want to go to the doctor. These are health issues that mimic dementia symptoms and are treatable. And I always talk about this because it's important to get to a doctor if you're having problems. Thyroid issues can cause um, confusion and memory loss. Vitamin deficiency, especially B12 and vitamin D. Infections, urinary tract infections are very, very bad um, about causing memory loss confusion. And if somebody has dementia and they get a urinary tract infection, it can make it even 10 times worse. Um, dehydration, older people have trouble drinking enough to keep hydrated. Uh, so, and dehydration, you can, you know, you can cause, can cause memory loss or confusion. Medication interactions, especially if they've started a new medication, but even if they've been taking a medication for years, and as we get older, our body metabolizes that medication differently, and it can cause side effects. And uh, I, we had a pharmacist talk once about this, and he said, yeah, he said, it, our body just changes as we get older. So that's something to think about, but especially if they've tried a new medication. Diabetes that is undetected and uncontrolled. Um, this is something that I didn't realize either. Brain tumors, of course. Lyme disease. Um, I've read so many articles. Chris Christopherson was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease but his wife just didn't think he had the right symptoms. And so a couple years later, um, they found out he had Lyme disease and he was treated with antibiotics and he gained most of his memory back, but not quite all of it. And I know I've read several other stories about people who were diagnosed with Alzheimer's, but it was Lyme disease. The Lyme disease test that is given to most people is only 50% accurate. There is another test that's a little bit better. So if you're thinking Lyme disease, go for the other test and keep pushing because it may be Lyme disease. And then vascular blockage. I mentioned neck arteries and veins a while ago. Um, I had a support group and a woman there said that um, she was in her 70s and, and she was getting the car and forget where she was going. And it turned out her neck arteries were clogged and she hadn't cleaned out. And it was like 10, 12 years later and she was fine. So that's why I say, it, go to a doctor, at least get, go to a GP, get some blood tests run, get some things checked out because it could be treatable. And you know, we could 
you could get back to normal. So, mm -hmm. so diagnosing Alzheimer's disease and dementia. A diagnosis will usually not be given the first visit to a doctor's office. If you go into a GP's doc office and say, well, I've got memory loss, you know, my memory loss is, uh, it's not very good. And, and they say, well, you probably got dementia. Here's some medicine. That's not good. You don't want to do that. Um, the, the Washington University in St. Louis is one of the leading research hospitals for Alzheimer's disease. And the doctors there will usually not give a diagnosis the first visit. They usually want a follow-up visit to see how the progression has gone. And this is after tests, all these um, tests that they do, they do family interviews. If you are caring for someone that you think has dementia, you need to keep a diary of what they're doing, when they're doing, how often they're doing it, that, things that are troubling you. Um, and then they'll go through the medical history, their family history. The co they'll do some cognitive testing. They'll do a physical neurological exam, blood test. If you have blood tests done at a general practitioner's office, have those sent to a neurologist if you go see a neurologist. And I would recommend seeing a neurologist um, if you have issues. Uh, brain scans, they may do MRIs or a PET scan. Uh, and a medication review, as I said, medications can cause problems. So they'll review, do a medication review. And they, they're they getting more into the biomarker tests. They can take spinal fluid and check the presence of the beta amyloid plaques uh, for Alzheimer's disease. So if you do have, or if you do have memory loss, um, go to a doctor and try to you're going to have to work hard to try to get a diagnosis is what i'm saying and do that for your loved one it makes sense even though it's scary and hard and sometimes in rural communities it's hard to find the right experts to go to mm -hmm. it's worth the extra effort and in larger communities when you have those um, it's important to take those steps so that you have the best diagnosis and the best information now we're getting into making your business dementia friendly. There's three aspects that we're going to talk about. Practicing good communication techniques, modifying the physical environment, and then tailoring programs and services. So I talked on uh, about the good communication strategies. And the rule number one rule is dementia is a processing disorder. People with dementia have trouble processing what they see, what they hear, what they feel, anything around them. And so you have to understand that we process things all the time. I mean, you, we don't even think about processing right. things. Um, we're, we process what we see, what we hear, what we smell, what we taste. Uh, but people with dementia, they, it's, they have trouble with that. And it causes challenges with understanding language. The speed of a typical conversation is too quick for a person living with dementia to understand and process successfully. And is it 30 seconds? Change? Yes, 15 to 30 seconds you should wait after someone, after you ask someone a question or you make a statement. Um, I, most times say 15, but I was at a conference where a man said 30 seconds, and that's a long time. So we have a challenge for you this afternoon or this evening while you're with someone that you, you know, just, just try that, make a statement, and then wait 30 seconds for That's, that time to pass. 15 seconds is even a long time. It's a long time. Yeah, because if you're working with, and, and honestly, for some of us right now who are stressed and you know just <laughs> overloaded, actually taking that extra time and observing that is not a bad idea either. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but I thought that was fascinating that we really do need to slow down. Good, um, good for anybody that you're dealing with. Um, especially as people get older, we, we do become a little bit slower in processing things. And, and um, so you can, you know, I would, it's just good customer service. It's excellent customer yeah. service, it really is. So yes. So being able to communicate verbally and non-verbally, they may struggle to find the right word. Or um, like I said, my mother, in law called to fly a plane and so you may have to think okay what's she talking about here and and think about that being able to function in an overstimulating environment noises and music um, they have trouble focusing on speaker with other background noises in my talks i usually use the analogy of a wedding reception and 
the person with dementia is trying to talk to the person in front of them. But there's music playing overhead. There's a group of kids running around. There's a group of adults laughing over on the other side. And for someone like you or I, we can focus on the person in front of us and listen to what they're saying. But a person with dementia hears the kids. They hear the music. They hear these people over here. And they have trouble focusing only on you. So um, that's a problem. And as dementia progresses, the language skills become even more impaired. so good where the lady was just all those things were coming at mm -hmm. her and she didn't have any way to to focus or any way to block any of that out that's that has to be a really scary experience for someone yeah. yeah if you sometimes if you just sit and if you're in a group just sit and think about all the noises that you're hearing it, it's overwhelming sometimes mm -hmm. so with dementia it's it's overwhelming. So these are the communication strategies. And what we have done, we have made up a card with these strategies, just a little uh, eight, five by seven card, I believe it is. And uh, that way they can keep it at their desk, at their station at the bank, at the library, wherever. Mm -hmm. And so it's just a quick reference if they see somebody that they think may have dementia. And so you want to approach from the front. Um, people with dementia, their field of vision narrows as they go through dementia. And so if you come up from the side, they may not see you until you're right there and you may start a little. You wanna make eye contact. When you make eye contact with someone that helps them to concentrate only on you and introduce yourself. Say, hi, I'm Shannon, can I help you today? And if you know their name, use it because that keeps their attention. Say, Jonna, would you please come over here, Jonna? do this, Jonna, do that. Um, and you keep your language short and simple. I always tell everybody, forget what you learned in grade school about compound sentences. With people with dementia, you need to use short and simple sentences. You can't say, um, put your, your return books here in a slot, and we'll go upstairs and we'll find some more books on animals for you. They've, you've lost them after put your, you, your return books in the slot. They probably forgot what you said after that. So you want to say, here, why don't you put your return books in the slot here? When they do that, say, let's go upstairs and look for some books and do it like that. You want to allow plenty of time for a person to speaking, you're speaking with to process. And like I said, 15 seconds is a good rule. One, one neurologist said 30 seconds. So it's a long time. It is a long time. And try to reduce background noise or other distractions. Even the library, you know, you don't have a lot of noise in a library. But for somebody with dementia, if there's too many people around, it may be a distraction. And if it is, take them into a, a room that's quieter or something, and you may be able to communicate better. Nonverbal cues are just as important as verbal cues. Watch your faces, watch their hands, see if they've got a book in their hand. And if they have a book in their hands, say, oh, are you returning this book? And you wait 30, 15 to 30 seconds. And if they say, no, do you want to check it out? You wait 15 to 30 seconds and, and just go from there. You know, just kind of watch their face, watch, see what they've got in their hands, anything. You can point to things, you know, would you like to go uh, to the video section, the DVD section? Um, you know, just things like that. And you want to be pleasant and unhurried in your manner and voice. People with dementia mirror the people that are around. If you're upset, if you're in a hurry, if you're jittery or whatever, they're going to mirror that and and they're going to mirror that back to you and it's gonna be more difficult to communicate with them. You wanna smile, you want to reassure them, we'll figure this out, we'll figure out what, we, what you need to do here. And you have to be patient, it's not easy. It's to be patient and smile and be pleasant. And that's why with caregivers, I always say, if you've had a fight with your husband or something and you go to care for your grandmother, Put that behind you because if you go in there irritated and upset, you're going to irritate and upset them, and it's going to make your day not very good at all. And the same thing happens with customers. Mm -hmm. You're right, Shannon. Mm -hmm. That's so true. I mean, you kind of have to close the door on what might have happened with a colleague or our, our son or daughter, and we just have to come to the floor to help people with our very best, very best um, self. But it's really important. 
because libraries know that we need to serve the public in a different way, in a way that people can trust, knowing that they can trust us and we need to have confidence that we're gonna be able to help them. And we have that, we wanna keep that going. So this mm -hmm. is even another reason to make sure that your frontline staff is informed about this and understands how this all works. I think one thing that keeps jumping out at me is the fact, I told Shannon before, that part about their vision narrowing is so important because we don't want to startle someone and we want to be able to approach them in the best way. So be aware that they may not see on your peripheral vision what's happening around them. So be aware. So now we'll move on to modifying the physical environment. I'm sure most of you do this already, but you want to create contrast on thresholds or steps leading in or out of the building and within the building. Um, as I said, their, field, their, um, their depth perception changes and they may not be able to see that step. So that helps a lot. Right, oh, sorry, <laughs> I wanted to say, along with that, uh, many of you have buildings that maybe have not had a walkthrough from someone who understands this. Shannon, if someone has an older building, who would you recommend with the Alzheimer's Association? Alzheimer's you Association, a, uh, health departments, possibly any type of um, agency that would that works with dementia, I'm sure they could. So, and like I said, it's just as simple as duct tape on the steps. It doesn't have to be anything expensive, something that will just stick bright, that's a large contrast, a very you know, big contrast with the surroundings. So yeah, um, Alzheimer's Association, they should be able to give you some uh, hints and uh, ideas and people to look, you know, to people to have come in. And it is worth the investment because these people need to use your space too. They, mm -hmm. they need to remain engaged in the community. So don't hesitate to reach out if you need help with that. And also when creating signs, make sure the words are clear and have a lot of contrast with the background. Try using a word and a picture together as we have here. Uh, a simple language and corresponding picture can help make signs easier to process. Don't get fancy like I've seen some restaurants with bathrooms that have cowgirls and cowboys on it. A person with dementia is gonna see that cowgirls, uh, they're not going to know that that's the best the restroom you stick with ladies and men and and um and then so like i said have a contrast with your signs and have them big enough that people can see another thing that works out well in this equivalent way is actually and it's hard to say that but <laughs> actually we have a new law that um our restrooms if it's a single restroom they are all family restrooms so there's no longer the male versus female and a family member can go in with them, which is helpful too mm -hmm. in the case of dementia. If there's a caregiver that's with someone and needs to stay with that person, there's no longer the stigma of having to go into the women's restroom. If they're opposite, right. oh, yeah. opposite sex, right. yes. Yes, it just yeah. take, took a lot of the pressure off mm -hmm. that. So if you have restrooms like that, it's a great idea to go ahead and just designate them as a family mm -hmm. bathroom. So you want to create clear, well-lit passages through the building. You want to have family bathrooms so caregivers can help provide support to the person they're caring for and provide seating area, which libraries, you, you have that. And add secure handrails and bars to assist with mobility in the bathroom and stairs and anywhere. So these are all good ideas. Mm -hmm. Okay, these are programs and services for libraries. I'm gonna let Jonna talk about some of these. Oh, sure. So we've been really blessed because Shannon's group has taken it upon themselves to like bring this to our community. They um, went ahead and they started the Tales and Travels program, or we did alongside with them and our cooperation. We based it on the Mary Beth Reidner um, program, which is out of Northern Illinois. We're really grateful for her for highlighting that and getting that started. If you wanna learn more about that, just look at Tales and Travels online. There's lots of different information about it. Um, there's some great coloring groups. I've seen this throughout the um, throughout the United States at a lot of libraries. Um, they can just basically um, have coloring sheets out, and it is amazing. Um, Shannon can attest to the fact that many many people with dementia can can still share and express art, and even people who had no interest in art before they had dementia. Um, 
there's programs for painting uh, for people with dementia and they create some beautiful paintings. So coloring is the same way. It, it could be just a marker. It can be paper on a table and you have markers and crayons and, and chalk even, and just they can, it's, it's amazing what they can do. actually has mushroomed and it's gone yes. into seven more counties around us which is fantastic and this is the part that I get excited about because there's books DVDs and reminiscent toolkits available for anyone regardless of a library card or not so for those of you in Illinois you understand that we have some um, unserved populations around us and people aren't able to check out items from our library but with our collaboration Shannon's group we've been able to make that possible so it's really important for us um, the books and DVDs and the reminiscent tools are all ones that have been curated by Shannon and her group. Our little library, we just haven't had enough time to dig in and um, find the best resources for um, families facing this journey, but Shannon has. So we've relied on her expertise and um, they've even provided those books for us, which we think is a fantastic partnership. So, but there's another resource online. Is it through, there was a library up north. Yeah. Um, uh, I want to say green something. Green County? No, 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 green. And I won't talk about this yeah. the next time. But I can't remember what it yeah. is now, but they have resources. And uh, the Alzheimer's Association website, I believe also has um, some, uh, res some reading resources. I, I get on Amazon and look for a five star and just kind of look for ideas on um, what I think would be a good fit. We start when we started all, Effingham Area Alzheimer's Awareness, we started with only Alzheimer's disease because um, that's what we knew. But within that first year, we had phone calls from people who were dealing with the frontal temporal dementia and the Lewy body dementia and the vascular dementia. And so we realized that we needed to offer other resources for other dementias. So um, we've done that. We have, have books on dementia, on the frontal temporal and the, and the um, Lewy body and the, even the Parkinson's. I think we have a couple on that also. So um, we were very blessed that the library um, was willing to work with us. And like I said, we purchased a lot of the books and the DVDs. So some of the DVDs are, um, they're long, but they're, so, uh, one series we have is by Tipa Snow. She's a nationally known uh, dementia practitioner and dementia um, trainer. She has a lot of good ideas on helping people care for uh, people living with dementia. So we have uh, a series of DVDs for that. And the Reminiscence Toolkits, um, we, my daughter worked in a, an Alzheimer's home in Creekcore, Missouri, and she was the assistant activity director. And they had three homes for Alzheimer's and in the early, middle, and late stage. And she was assistant activity director for late stage. And I have to admit, when she started this, she was still in college. And I said, well, what kind of activities can you do with people in the late stage? And she said they had these reminiscence toolkits and that it was amazing what memories can be invoked by if someone was a farmer they would have farming magazines they might have um, a bag of corn or soybeans they might have animals that you know sheep or pigs or something or maybe little tractors and and um, and it was amazing what those things could could um how they, yeah, the connection that they made, or maybe it was cooking. A woman, you know, had an apron, or maybe um, a jar of cinnamon. They could smell that. Uh, hot pads, or maybe recipe, you know, cookbooks or magazines, cooking magazines, and so just. And you don't even have to have a reminiscence toolkit. You can use these at home. If say your grandmother, she quilted all the time. Get some quilting books, get her quilts out. Say, Grandma, you made this, I just love this quilt you made for me. Where did you get the pattern? See if she can remember, see if you can spark some, some connection there. Um, and that helps caregivers so much. And they can make a connection even for a few minutes. 
even for a few minutes a day. Right. So the books, the DVDs, and the reminiscent toolkits are all available for checkout to help people support them. And if you ever want like a quick what's great, just give us a shout out or look at our online catalog and you can see what we have available. There's a music and memory program, which actually is nationwide too. Mm -hmm. And it has iPods that are available for checkout with different genres of music programmed on them. You all know that music is one of the last things that people continue to remember. That's right. And comfort them. And yeah, that's a great way to connect with them too. You have to know what music they like. I teased my husband. I said, well, if he gets dementia, I'm going to, he's, I'm going to get the Beatles, the, the Beach Boys and that kind of music for him because that's what he likes. And, and, but I'm country. I'm 80, 70 and 80s country. You know? So, so it's, it's important to know what type of music. Sometimes it's gospel. Sometimes it's religious. Sometimes it's the big band era. You know, right. you, you don't know. So, but you can make a connection. If go to the music of memory uh, website and it, it has some videos that are just amazing. Uh, music can help. And it's so that's helpful. It's really helpful. Um, one of my favorite things that we do here at the library is host the educational meetings. We have, my goodness, um, Shannon typically does about four a year. Mm -hmm. And um, since they've been doing it so long for us, they've kind of worked into their very favorite ones or the ones that our community is most responsive to. And um, we did work with the Alzheimer's Association to begin with, mm -hmm. Shannon did, but they simply didn't have the staff or the time to drive mm -hmm. two hours mm -hmm. either down from Bloomington or up from the <laughs> south end of the state mm -hmm. yeah to support our people in our community so that's how Shannon's group has begun to just take that on but if you have an Alzheimer's uh, association in your area they could provide people that can talk at educational meetings um, we do several we do I do one on memory loss what you need to know that's the basics um, a lot of what we've talked here. We have one on communication only. And um, we have someone comes in and talks about long-term care. They talk about what you need to know for in-home care, what the different types of uh, memory homes, the nursing homes, the assisted livings, what, what the difference is and what you need to know. Um, we have a legal, uh, uh, an attorney come in and talk about elder law, which is a very popular program because it's not just elder law. Every, anybody who has law questions comes and um, she's been very good. Uh, like I said, we have had um, a person come in and talk about brain health, things you need to know to be healthy. So, um, you know, there's a lot of other uh, areas you can talk about, but those seem to be our most popular and those are the ones that we host mm -hmm. most. And it's really important that you do these um, like quarterly because mm -hmm. people, that diagnosis is happening, you know, mm -hmm. and, and new families are coming into the situation. So it's really important to keep an eye out for that. And with COVID, we have, I had two meetings before COVID started and luckily I had one here. Yes. But then I had some scheduled, but I didn't have those. So we probably, hopefully we can start next year again. And finally, um, host those social meetings for the elderly and people living with dementia. Our library is really, and we have, um, it's celebrated 10 years this past um, September. It's called Seniors with an Attitude Group or a SWAG group. And they're a lot of fun. Um, they support one another. We sometimes meet at places outside our library, like this next one we'll meet at the Whistling Kettle Tea Shop. But otherwise we meet here at the library, we do some reminiscing together, we talk about what's new and books and things of that nature. It's an opportunity to socialize because as Shannon has said again and again, it's so important that people stay connected and libraries can provide that for an important piece of that. And if you can find, if you have a support group for either caregivers and or the people living with dementia. There are support groups out there for people living with dementia. You could host those at your libraries also. And that's so, because we are a neutral place. A lot of people are um, shy away from joining a support group because they're like, that. I don't want that to define me. Right. And that is important. We don't need to be defined by that kind of, that really heavy burden. So mm -hmm. it's important to have that at a library where people are, feel a little more supported and it's not just about that. This is the global dementia friendly community um, symbol. I, when I do 
uh, training with any business or organization. I always have some stickers for them to stick in the windows. Uh, I was in Wisconsin two, three years ago on vacation and there was an ice cream shop there and they had one of these in the window. So I knew that they were, they knew about dementia. And I asked one, a person behind the counter and she said, yeah, the owner's grandmother had had dementia or something. So it's recognized, I recognize, you know, it, it's something that I don't know if the Minneapolis St. Paul organization uses it, but we've decided to use it. And we're hoping that it becomes more common. These are some additional programs um, that you can use the Dementia Friendly America website. Uh, they have sector guides for libraries, banks, uh, all kinds of different things. Um, and then the art of Alzheimer's. They talk about the art uh, of people living with Alzheimer's. So there's a lot of different things out there that I haven't even you know, got on here, but it's on the web, on the web, yeah. Okay. And some references here. Um, and then this is our contact information for myself and my daughter, who um, we are co-founders of the Effingham Area Alzheimer's Awareness, and then John us. So feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. And um, that's our presentation. Yes, and we're really grateful you joined us today. And do, don't hesitate to join us or contact us. Yeah, and now we'll get started. <sighs>